Hello everyone, welcome to another one of my videos where I talk about the world of data. Now in this video, um, I'm going to cover off a topic where I got an actual, actual message on LinkedIn where someone asked me um, if they're currently employed as a business intelligence uh, analyst uh, and they're wondering whether they should go freelance. Okay, so it's actually a quite a common question. So a lot of analysts, they, they pick up skills, they work for a few years and they realize that actually going freelance is, um, I mean, sometimes there's, there's a couple of reasons why you might want to go freelance. One is obviously you can actually get more money so there's huge demand for um, analysts, especially if you've got a, a technical skill that's in demand, uh, like business intelligence, where you can build reports in either Tableau, Power BI, um, you know, and, and other uh, sort of technologies out there. So there's a quite big demand for that. But the second reason sometimes people go is for flexibility, and they want to also get variety. So you know th th they want to be able to work on their own terms, um, and you know take long holidays and stuff without being accountable to anyone. But also they want variety because when you work for a, a single client, for example, you might find that your or um, experience is quite limited to that client, to that sector, to that domain. And if you become a freelancer, then you actually get a much more variety in the kind of work that you do. So you're still building uh, reports and dashboards uh, for your clients, but actually from different sectors. So you get familiar with very different uh, data sets, but also you get very familiar with the kind of uh, challenges that business um, face. And therefore, it actually gives you much more experience in the data analytics space. If you are going to move, okay, the first thing you have to ask yourself is that do you believe that you can get clients? Okay. Now, one of the um, uh, easiest way to determine this is to actually, before you leave, to do this as a side hustle. Okay. Now, obviously, I talk about another video how to start a side hustle, um, but you just need to be mindful that it doesn't um, uh, conflict or go against any of the terms you have with your current employer that you that you can't work for someone else or you can't work for a competitor. So just make sure you get those things sorted. But to know that if you've got demand, you could do as a side hustle. The other thing is just to uh, approach people and see if they would hire a freelance data analyst or the, the, the easiest way actually is just to go speak to a recruiter. Okay, you can see how many roles they have. You can actually just go on LinkedIn and see how much demand there is for contracting um, uh, business intelligence developers. Okay, but the best way is to go to recruiters. Okay, so if you go to a recruiter and you say, look, I'm thinking of becoming a freelancer and in, in business intelligence um, uh, analyst, business intelligence BI analyst, um, you know, is there demand for that? And they can tell you straight, they'll be quite honest with you because what they don't want is someone who comes looking for work for them and they can't give them anything because they'll bad for them um, and they don't, also don't want someone who's um, not got the right skills. So ask a recruiter and they'll hopefully tell you if there's demand or not. Okay. One of the things they will ask you is what exact skills do you have and what you actually need. So there's two things. There's the skills that you think you have and the skills that are needed by the business. Okay. So you might think that I'm actually a very good um, uh, you know, business intelligence developer in terms of building Tableau reports. Okay. But the marketplace may want someone who can also connect to data sources in Tableau um, through APIs and, and, and other the connectors okay so you need to make sure that if you have that skill to highlight it sometimes um, you know in, in the space of data analytics some of the skills you take for granted you assume everybody must have them like SQL a lot of data analysts I know don't really uh, promote the fact that they have SQL skills um, but but it's a huge demand skill and so therefore it's worth promoting that skill so the first thing is like I said if you want to know uh, whether it's worth becoming freelance is to, is to determine if there's a demand uh, for for uh, business intelligence analysts and it doesn't have to be in your area just to demand generally because now now, a lot of work is done remotely, so it's not necessarily that you need to look at in your area. You could have a, a larger geographic um, catchment area. Then the next thing is, how do you go about doing it? Okay, so there are different rules in different countries. So, for example, in the UK, um, because of AR, IR35, uh, sometimes it's very hard to work as a freelancer um, for, a, for a company because you fall within the IR35 rules, which means that you're tax liability is higher. So uh, again, it depends on your individual circumstances. If you feel that this is something you're going to do for a long term, uh, for in the long in the long term, um, and something that you want to um, uh, sort of pursue, I guess, then I would suggest you set up a company. It just makes it easier. Sometimes you can also find um, uh, within your network other people who can work by your company to deliver a joint project. So you might go in to deliver a business intelligence project, building reports out in Power BI, but, it, but you might need some data engineering, you might need some uh, SQL skills. So what you might find that you group up with a couple of people and through your company you deliver the service and therefore you fall outside IR35. But there is a problem that if it's just you, then you could fall within IR35. Different 
different countries may have their own uh, uh, regulation and stuff. But if you think about if you're thinking about doing freelancing in the long term, my advice is set up a company. So it gives you flexibility of doing other things. And also sometimes when you go and sign contracts, companies are much more confident in working with co uh, companies. Um, OK, and also for, for their tax implications as well, like charging VAT, um, showing their auditors that they're actually, you know, you, you, you would actually pay your taxes because if you're a, a company, you'd be a registered company, therefore you'd pay your taxes. So if you like I said, if you're going to think about doing it in the long term, set up a company. So then the other thing is, um, how do you go about promoting your services. So the, the first thing I would suggest is that get your LinkedIn in order, you know, because it's the first place most people will look. And also you'd put the link of your LinkedIn link in your CV. So get your LinkedIn order, make sure it highlights your or showcases the, the good work that you've done and especially in the work that you want to focus on. OK, so you want to write more about, uh, especially in this case, being a business, in, business intelligence analyst and developer, you want to show more of that uh, in LinkedIn and you probably want to show less of every other things that you may have done early in your career. Then Obviously, after you've got your LinkedIn sorted, you want to then get your CV sorted. OK, so make sure that what you talk about in LinkedIn is also reflected in your CV, um, but keep the CV um, very structured. So the way I, I would generally uh, structure the CV is I would have a, a summary section where I talk about what I bring to the table. OK, and then how I can help the client. So, for example, if you're a business intelligence developer, uh, you would say this is what I do. I build reports and dashboards. I've got experience in um, you know, Power BI, Tableau. Google Data Studio, other technologies, Looker, for example, which I believe is now Google Data Studio. Um, but, you know, I've got a, 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 um, experience in these technologies. And then what do I bring? I can help you build, you know, tell stories with your data. I can help you solve your um, reporting problem. OK, so in that summary, you sort of want to say, what do I bring to the table and how can I use that to help you? OK, then I would list your experiences. OK, and here, don't try and go into too much detail about everything you've done. Just I mean, the best way is just a bullet point a few things about each role that you did especially if you've got a lot of roles just bullet point a few things that you've that you've done that are related to being a business intelligence developer if you haven't got many roles if you've done like only one or two roles then actually try and group them under projects okay say I, I, I delivered a project for this team and this is the, the three or two or three things that I did I delivered a project for this team these are the two or three things team that I did and make sure you keep it relevant to to uh, business being a business intelligence developer and then you would probably finish off your um, CV typical stuff education education um, and you know the things like inter people always put like, my interest and stuff that's not necessarily relevant references aren't necessarily relevant because if, I, again like I said you know um, uh, once you've created your CV I would go through you know you would check if there's a um, demand for a business intelligence developer through recruiters I would also go through recruiters to find projects okay because they usually the, the people who are networked and connected with clients who need who need these services rather than you go out and try and find those clients try and go for a recruiter later on you'll be your own network and it will become much easier to have direct clients but in the early days go through that um, and so like I said before because your CV will go through a recruiter there's no need to put what my interests are or you know references they'll they'll do all that stuff for you and then obviously when you um, if you go for a recruiter the recruiter will have like a standard contract that you can sign and and the client will also sign so that's all fine but if you're going direct for example you will need your own standard contract now what I would look for is just a template of a freelance temp uh, um, of a freelance uh, um, uh, service okay don't try and invent something yourself otherwise you're going to have to spend a lot of money on lawyers to get something that's legally uh, robust um, typically you might find that if you speak to a friend who's already a freelancer they've already got a template you need to take that I would read through it though in detail because sometimes there are clauses that you may not want to um, include in there um, so what I would do is just, just read through it and I would uh, de decide whether they're the kind of stuff that I want to include or not. Okay, and if there's a clause you don't understand, then you may need to want to speak to someone. I mean, if you've got a friend who's a lawyer, then speak to them just to understand what that clause means. But if you haven't, then maybe collect all the questions that you have and go and you know pay for an hour of a lawyer's time um, just to get them to answer those questions for you. It's best to be reassured what, that you know what you're uh, signing in those contracts. So have your own freelancer contract, um, and whenever you get a client, you just give them that uh, and they'll sign it. The other things that you will probably need is a NDA. Um, so that because they're going to share data with you, um, you know, so you probably need an NDA. And again, you can find standard NDAs, mutual NDAs, so it's two-way um, NDAs that, that you can sign. So I wouldn't go creating your own. I'd just try and find one. Again, speak to people who are already doing this kind of stuff and they will be able to happily share a template with you. And then the final thing that people ask is, if I become a freelance, uh, you know, uh, 
analyst or in this case a business intelligence developer slash analyst um, how, how do you get paid so it actually quite depends so like if you go direct um, you could say look I want to be paid um, upfront um, for a portion of the work and then I, I want to be paid every fortnightly if you go for a recruiter uh, typically they will pay you weekly or fortnightly or sometimes monthly it all depends I mean it all depends on what your circumstances are if you have cash reserves then you find that people are happy to pay you monthly if people are, uh, want to pay you monthly and you're happy for that then that's good but if you don't have cash reserves and you want the payment to be a bit sooner then fortnightly is usually a typical uh, time frame for uh, freelance or business intelligence developers to do if however you go into a company and you do it like a project rather than time and material so the difference between time and material is that you're going in there is no set project you're just doing whatever they ask you to do you're you're fulfilling a role for them okay then normally you would just say look i want to be paid every two weeks or four weeks and you would send them an invoice and then it will take another depending on uh, the agreement you have but sometimes with companies it could take another 30 to 90 days before they pay you with a recruiter they manage that they will pay you straight away so you can get paid every fortnightly and then they will take the risk of being paid for from the client okay that's that's their business okay so um like i said um if you anybody if you work on a project for example you may decide that you you want 10% or 20% up front, 50% in the middle and the remainder amount at the end. But it all depends how you, uh, what your, what, what the expectations of your client are. I'll just be telling you now, from my experience, most clients will pay at the end. So if it's a, especially if it's a small project, if it's like four to six weeks, they'll expect you to invoice them at the end when the project has been satisfactorily completed. And then you'll submit the invoice and it could take another 30, some clients actually take up to 90 days to pay. Some clients are really brilliant. You send them the invoice and they'll, pay you straight away okay but that does depend on a case-by-case -case basis personally I would stick to 30-day payment terms if it's a project and you're invoicing at the end because don't forget let's say it's a, a one month project so you do a month you then invoice and then it's another month so it's two months before you get paid okay if you go through a recruiter you should expect to be paid every fortnightly um, payment um, but if you work on a really big project let's say you, your client wants you to work on a six-month project agree with them that you will invoice them something up front and then every month you will invoice them and that way where you start getting regular cash flow it's always nice to get like a big lump sum at the end of a project but it's not practical you've got bills to pay and um, so you want to be paid in between that's my advice if you want to become a freelance business intelligence developer i uh, hope you found the video useful please do subscribe to my channel and of course please do like and share the video thank you